All right, let's uh, look at the word of the Lord together and uh, see what God has to say to us. Luke chapter 19 and verse 10 is the theme scripture for the Lost and Found series. Uh, and so I want to invite you to uh, read together with me uh, this verse of scripture. Let's read it aloud. The Son of Man came to seek and to save those who are lost. And now let's hold up our copy of the scriptures, whether you have... Uh, the pages that you're flipping through or whether you're looking through digitally, uh, it's still the Word of God. And let's pray together. Lord Jesus, give me eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart that is willing to obey your Word. Through the power of your Holy Spirit, I pray. Amen. Amen. Finding peace in the midst of the storm. Watch this. I'm singing in the rain, just singing in the rain. What a glorious feel, and I'm happy again. I'm laughing at clouds so dark up above The sun's in my heart and I'm ready for love Let the stormy clouds chase everyone from the place Come on with the rain, I have a smile on my face I'll walk down the lane with a happy refrain Just singing, singing in the rain I heard a few of you wanting to sing along, singing in the rain. You know, we all face storms in life. Sometimes those storms may be like the downpour in which we are drenched to the skin. And uh, in storms like those, how many of you know one of these is absolutely worthless? You know? How many of you had one of these turn inside out on you? Yeah, I've had a few of those. But when the storms of life come, how will we respond to those storms? Will we be overcome by the storm? Will we be trying to keep the wind from hitting us in the face? Will the storms and gales blow and we shiver in the cold? Or will we have peace in the midst of the storm? Yes, storms will come and go, but even in the midst of life's worst storm, Jesus is still with us. He is our ever-present help in time of need. Jesus is there to give us peace, a peace that is beyond any human understanding, peace that does not make sense to you or to me, peace that does not make sense to our friends, family, neighbors who see us going through storms. Jesus is the Prince of Peace and He empowers you, He empowers me to live a life of joy, singing in the rain, even in the midst of the storm. We do our very best to deal with life storms. Problems come to all of us and they come in all shapes and sizes. Problems even came to the Apostle Paul. Uh, how many of you think you've had a bad day? Paul had several bad days. In 2 Corinthians 11, verses 24 to 27, he uh, gives a list of some of the storms and difficulties that he experienced in his life. He says there were five times that he was whipped with the 39 lashes, three times that he was beaten with rods. There was one occasion that he was stoned and left for dead. No, that was not that he had too much to drink and was uh, inebriated, uh, or however that is said. Uh, but instead, they literally took rocks and tried to kill him by stoning him to death. Uh, 
Three times he was shipwrecked. Once he was adrift a day and a night in the sea. He traveled on long journeys. This was not a 747 journey that he would take, you know, for 24 hours. But these were journeys that he would walk and travel uh, across wildernesses and all kinds of places. He says he faced dangers from rivers. He was in peril from robbers. He was persecuted by the Jews. He was oppressed by the Gentiles as well. He was in danger from those who claimed to be believers. Those who said they were Christians but were not. He knew what it was to be in danger in cities and in deserts. Danger from those who uh, wanted to just kill him. He has been hungry, thirsty, gone often without food. He shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep him warm. Paul's had a bad day or two. He's faced some storms. And yet, even as Paul understood what it was like to be hit with the storms of life, Paul's storms did not make him grow bitter, but Paul grew better through the storms. Paul is the one who was able to say that the Philippians not once, not twice, but three times rejoice in the Lord. He says, rejoice in the Lord, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. I've been through some storms, but the joy of the Lord in me is bigger than the storm. You know, we live in a technologically advanced day and age. So we have weathermen who try to predict and tell us when the storms are coming. Uh, if you are like me and you have a smartphone, you may have the weather app on your phone and it will actually push the alert to you when a weather advisory has been posted for wherever you are at in the world. I'm amazed that my phone knows where I am and that weather system knows he needs an alert not for home but for wherever I have traveled to. And it keeps me aware of what might be coming. Some of those storms are so big that weathermen give them names like well, most recently there was that little storm that blew into New Jersey called Sandy. There was the storm that came to New Orleans we know as Katrina. Devastating storms. And yet, we're not talking about just the weather. We face a lot of different kind of storms in our lives. Yes, sometimes there may be what the insurance company calls the act of God, uh, and a tornado may destroy your house. That's quite the storm to have to endure. But we have other storms that we might be going through today. Sometimes the storms can be predicted, and sometimes these storms come suddenly without any warning into our lives. Uh, some of the names we might give those storms might include something like a job loss. Have you ever found yourself in the unemployment line? Uh, unsure about your future. Maybe it's the financial stress or a storm that you might call debt. How many of you know that storm? How about relational conflict? Th that's a storm that comes in all kinds of shapes and sizes. It could just be a, you know, a, a little disagreement between friends. It could be an argument between a husband and a wife. It could be a rebellious teenage son or daughter. It could be the terrible twos. <laughs> there are all kinds of relationships. It could be uh, something with, at school with a teacher or a principal. There's conflict. There's misunderstandings. How about those storms that we call sickness? Have you had to face any health issues? Uh, unexpected uh, diagnosis from the doctor? You went in for a routine checkup and instead you're told bad news. Unexpected things that you didn't know to be looking for. And of course there's always that storm of death. I've had the thought ringing through my head this week. Everybody dies. But not everybody really lives. Isn't that true? 
And yet we as Christians have been given life, and Jesus says he's come to give us life abundantly, life that is to the full. Life that is abundant and full, even in the midst of storms. Storms even like death that don't overcome us. I've had to face just about all of those different kinds of storms. How about you? We've all gone through difficulties and storms in our life. Um, it's amazing. There's a, there's a simple relational storm that uh, Pastor Gary and I have been dealing with. You know, when you're wanting to do great things for God, how many of you know the devil doesn't like it? Okay? And uh, we were going through the process this week of developing this message because he's preaching the message live in Mogador today. Uh, and so we were working together to try and put this all about. And how many of you know when you put two heads together, sometimes there's conflict? Just go ahead, bump the head of the person next to you. <laughs> Those two heads can't occupy the same space at the same time. You know, there's, there, there's, there's that possibility of conflict. Now understand, Pastor Gary and I love each other and we are committed to each other, but we had to be reminded and be aware of the fact that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, that it's not just him and me. And, and we're pastors, <laughs> you know? We ought to be able to get along, right? We're on the same team. Well, we do get along. But we, we are both strong leaders and we can both at times want to express our opinion and we gotta, we're, we're learning how to work together. This is a new journey for us. What, what are some of the storms that you have faced? What are some of the issues that you've gone through? Maybe like me, things that you are facing today. You know, you're kind of like uh, Pigpen in the Charlie Brown cartoon, but it's... It's not a cloud of dirt. It's just a cloud that's always over your head and raining. It, it's always difficult for you. Uh, what is your storm that you're facing today? Regardless of the storm, Jesus wants you and me to have peace in the midst of the storm and learn to live our lives free from worry. I like to think that Jesus would want us to picture and imagine that he is our umbrella of peace to keep us safe in the midst of the storm. Jesus says in Matthew 6, verses 30 to 34, he says, Don't have so little faith. Don't worry and say, what will we eat or what will we drink, what will we wear? The people who don't know God keep trying to get these things and your Father in heaven knows that you need them. Seek first God's kingdom and what he wants. Then all of your other needs will be met as well. So don't worry about tomorrow. Would you repeat that, that verse 34 with me? So don't worry about tomorrow. Uh, to worry is human, isn't it? Doesn't worry come easy to all of us when the lightning flashes and the thunder rolls? How many of us know what it is, whether as children or, yes, even as adults, to begin to be concerned, worried? Will the next bolt of lightning hit the tree in my front yard and it comes crashing down on my house? I'm afraid of the dark. What if the lights go out? We begin to imagine all kinds of possibilities in the storms. And when we are going through one of those storms in life, it's easy for us to begin to worry, to begin to imagine the worst. I can't tell you the number of times that Susie has been at work, and when she's at work, and I mean by work, not working at home. She works hours and hours at home, but sometimes she's traveling. And when she is uh, on her way back from Toledo to home, and either the weather is bad or it could be a sunshiny, beautiful day, and I haven't been able to get a hold of her on the phone, and I haven't been able to, uh, or she's running a little bit late. Um, I confess there are times that I worry. My imagination gets the best of me, and I imagine, oh no, what if she's had a wreck? 
Okay, what if something has happened? Thank God it never has happened. But how many times have I had that same worry come up over the last 10 years or more that she's been doing this job traveling the state of Ohio? Aren't we all like that? Worry comes naturally. And yet I hope that we can see what Jesus is trying, one of the things he's trying to tell us is that worry is a choice. We can choose to worry in the same way that I can choose whether or not I'm going to go down the path of worry and imagine the worst that Susie's in a ditch, the car's turned upside down, the ambulance is still on its way. The tow truck hasn't arrived. She's alone and by herself. In the same way that I'm imagining the worst, I can choose to imagine the best. I can choose to, to not go down that rabbit trail. I, I think it was uh, D.L. Moody who said that, you know, you, can, you can't help it when a bird flies over your head, but you can keep it from building a nest in your hair. The reality is we can't control the moment-to-moment -moment thoughts that come into our minds, but we can control whether or not whether we are going to choose to continue to follow that thought and let it grow and gain uh, dominance in our thinking. There's another thing that maybe this might surprise you, but it's something to think about and ask the Holy Spirit to show you whether or not Jesus would want you to think about worry this way. Could it be that we need to see that worry is a sin? What, what about worry? The psalmist said, May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my God, my rock, my redeemer. Lord, let the thoughts in my mind be something that's pleasing to you. Paul said in Romans 14, 23, What does not proceed from faith is sin. When I am worried about Susie, or if I'm worried about my kids, or if I'm worried about the church, or any of those kind of things, it takes faith to pray about those things, but it doesn't take faith to imagine the worst. Jesus said, don't worry. Don't worry about these things. And he said, we're to teach one another to obey everything he has taught us. And so if we struggle with worry, are we disobeying the very thing Jesus told us not to do? What about worry? Is it something that's sin? And yet here again, let's be reminded to worry is human. You see, whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. We live in the flesh. And we have to learn what it means to crucify our flesh. That, that we live in Christ to repent of our worry. Repentance is not just to say, God, forgive me because I've been worrying. Uh, we, 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 we have boiled down repentance to think that it's nothing more than a prayer. Jesus, forgive me. And yet repentance is an action. Repentance is to recognize I have been walking and I have been living according to my flesh, according to the ways that are natural for me, that the ways that are human. And I come to a place of choice that I say, I can't continue to be me and do what I want to do. I'm going to turn towards God. And I'm going to say, Lord, I'm going to live in a way that's pleasing to you. That's repentance. And so when it comes to our thoughts, there are times we have to just say, no, I'm not going to follow that thought anymore. I'm going to change my way of thinking. And yet, it's not something we can do in our own strength. It's not something that we can muster up enough human willpower to do. It's something that Jesus does in us. Because we are dead in our sins and transgressions, but He makes us alive. We have to learn to depend upon His life. So how can we be free from worry and experience peace in the midst of a storm? I want us to remember this morning that Jesus was not overcome by life's storms. Would you say that with me? Jesus was not overcome by life's storms. 
You might remember there was the occasion that Jesus and his disciples were caught in a storm. They were on the Sea of Galilee. It was after Jesus had fed the 5,000 and he said, let's go over to the other side. And they got in the boat and as they were on their way across the lake, a storm came up. Matthew records it this way. Then he got in the boat and his disciples followed him. Suddenly a fur furious storm came upon the lake so that the waves swept over the boat, but Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him saying, Lord, save us. We are going to drown. He replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and he rebuked the winds and the waves. And it was, what does it say? Completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. If you've got your Bibles, I want you to circle those couple of things that I've noted there. With Jesus' words, he says, You of little faith, why are you so afraid? And the disciples responded when they saw the calm. Who is this man? What kind of man is this that the winds and the waves obey him? The disciples responded in a normal way. They panicked. They became fearful and worried. And yet with a heart of peace, Jesus was at the back of the boat sleeping. He was in perfect peace and he could rest even in the middle of the storm. This story illustrates for us how, like the disciples, you and I respond to the storms of life. Like the disciples, we will respond with fear and worry. We will be panicked. However, fear and worry is only a dysfunction of not knowing who Jesus is. And so in turn, we don't understand who we are in Him. Let's look at the human response to those storms that come in our lives. The storm comes. It's life's circumstances and situations. They come along and often these things happen and we would call it a storm. Some of them are so big we can name them. You can go to that place in your mind right now and remember the biggest storm you've ever gone through. You can f feel again the pain. The disciples were on the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is situated between some mountains and so it was not uncommon for uh, it to be a beautiful day. And then suddenly and without warning a front will come across one of those mountains, sweep down that mountainside and hit the Sea of Galilee and the waves begin to grow, the sky becomes dark. And that's what happened. They were caught off guard. They were surprised by this storm. And suddenly the wind is blowing in their face. The waves are filling the boat. You lose sight of the shore. You, you can't see where you're going. Isn't that how it often is with the storms of life? We, we lose our sense of direction. We're not sure of ourselves. And when those storm comes, that's when we begin to respond with the crisis response, with the panic. The disciples were bailing water as quickly as they could. They, they, were, they, they, they weren't even thinking about the fact, uh, is Jesus helping us get the water out of the boat? We're, we're going to drown. We're going to sink here quickly. Is everybody doing their part? They were, they were responding, doing what they knew to do. How many times do you do what you know to do? Uh, I'm going I'm to make that quick response. And sometimes we make that quick crisis response without even looking for Jesus. And as the storm continues and the waves get worse, there is the emotional upheaval. The fear and the worry set in. The disciples come to Jesus, don't you care that we are about to drown? God, where are you? Don't you care for me? What's going on here? I thought you loved me. We've all felt that way, haven't we? The fear, the worry, the questioning. 
don't you care if I die? God, where are you? And we are so easily overcome with that emotional upheaval, fear, worry, and anxiety. And what that results in is Satan uses the storm to distort and pervert our view of Jesus. That we don't understand Jesus for who he is. How many of you remember the devil is a liar? Say that with me. The devil is a liar. And he's going to tell you God doesn't care. He's going to tell you God is powerless. That you're in this alone. That you have to fend for yourself. The devil wants to use the storm so that you doubt God, that you are confused about who he is, and that you can't imagine Jesus can do anything to help you. The power of the storm is too big for Jesus. That's the lie of the devil. And with each storm, again and again, the wounds of pain and regret and sorrow from the past are opened again in our lives. We know we're powerless to change anything. We are being hit by the storm. We are being overcome. We just, we're just hoping that this storm will come to an end. And with each storm, our wounds get bigger and deeper. The pain increases. The panic gets bigger. Where is Jesus? Where am I supposed to go? I've lost my sense of direction. Because all we can see is the storm. But what happened in this story? Jesus was right there. He was in the midst of the storm. So that when Jesus got up, he didn't grab a bucket and start bailing water. But he simply stood up and he spoke to the winds and the waves. And the scripture says he rebuked them. How many of us in our minds imagine Jesus just getting up and saying, Peace be still. That's how I've always imagined it. Jesus stands up and says, Winds! Silence! Waves! Be still! With authority and power, he speaks to them. And immediately, immediately, it's calm. And the disciples respond saying, What kind of man is this? That he gets up and he rebukes the winds and the waves, and they obey him. Jesus will do the same thing in the storms of your life. You see, Jesus is present with you in the midst of the storm, but I want you to understand today that Jesus does not look at the storm the same way we do. We start at the top looking at the situation, looking at the storm, and we can't see Jesus there, can we? And that's because Jesus works from the inside out. Jesus is at the place of our wound and at the place of our pain. He is there to expose the hurt again, the pain again, because while the devil will use the storm to distort your view of Jesus and lie to you about God's care for you, Jesus will use the very same storm to open up the wound so that he can bring healing to that wound. He doesn't want you to continue to live with a painful past and the hurts and the hang-ups that cause you to panic and lose your sense of direction. He wants to bring healing. He is at the innermost place where you hurt the most and where it's the hardest for us to see Jesus. That's where He is to bring healing from the inside out. And as we feel His touch, as we feel that healing balm of the Holy Spirit over that wounded place of us, our view of Jesus is suddenly transformed. Jesus, you care for me in ways that I couldn't even imagine. 
Jesus, you know me better than I know myself. I, I, re I remember it was the day before my dad actually died. I remember taking the walk. I remember going down the street asking some of those very questions. God, why? I don't understand. And I came to a place where I saw and I stood on a bridge and looked at a railroad track. And that railroad track was making a curve so that I couldn't see what was around the corner. And the Lord just spoke to my heart and said, your dad is right on track. And I know where he's going. My walk to the hospital was a little bit different on the way back. Because Jesus touched me at my deepest point of need. He said, I understand that you don't know what's about to happen. That you don't know where he's going. But he's right on track. I know where he's going. I know what he needs. Trust me. And within 24 hours, he was right on track. And the whistle blew in heaven. Another saint has come home. Jesus met me right at my point of need. And my picture of Jesus changed that day. Because he knew me better than I knew myself. And he could use the storm to show me how much he cares. And so in the midst of that, as I got a new view of Jesus, worry gives way to peace. Instead of fear and anxiety, instead of the emotional upheaval, that's all gone. Now I can be at rest. Instead of imagining the worst, we can begin to picture what God is doing in and through our lives. Even in the midst of the darkest storm, we get our direction back. We can see where we're going and we know where Jesus is leading us. You see, because now instead of responding in a crisis and panic, we can begin to respond with faith. We can begin to have the wisdom of the Lord to know the right thing to do in the moment of our need, in the moment of the storm. We live by faith and not by sight. And the reality is sometimes life's storm has not changed. Oh, I thank God. Don't you thank God for the times that Jesus reveals himself in even a greater way and he stands up and he rebukes the storm. He rebukes the devourer in your life. It says, no more! Stop! And peace comes. The storm is gone. But you see, when we understand that Jesus is working from the inside out, even if the storm doesn't change, the healer is still there working inside me. The Prince of Peace has still come. And so we have that peace that Paul describes in Philippians, in which he says, our peace does not make sense. We have a peace that transcends human understanding. That's what Jesus gives us. You see, the reality is when we come to have a new understanding of who Jesus is in the midst of the storm, we know that Jesus, He Himself, is our peace in the storm. Jesus said in John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Jesus says He gives us peace. He gives of Himself my peace I give to you. I'm glad to know that Jesus does not give of His peace in the same way that the world gives things to us. The world will give with strings attached. They'll give and take. The world will give looking to have something in return that they're going to try to, ta to take for themselves in giving. 
But Jesus doesn't give like the world. He gives of himself and he gives his peace. In John 16, 33, Jesus said, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In Jesus, we can have peace. He goes on and he says, in the world, you will have tribulation. In the world, you will have storms that will blow into your life. But he says, take heart for I have overcome the world. Jesus is greater than the storm that you may face. Jesus has the power to speak to the winds and the waves and say, peace be still, to tell them to stop and to move no further. Aren't you glad that when, when he comes in and brings of himself the peace that does does not make under make make sense to the world that Jesus can say to the devourer stop no more Jesus gives us his peace he's overcome greater is the one who's in you greater is the prince of peace in you than the storms of life and the one who is in this world that would seek to destroy you that's why i like to say that Jesus is our umbrella in the midst of a storm. You see, for me, umbrellas, <laughs> they're not even a necessary evil. I, I don't think about taking an umbrella with me. If I, if I have an umbrella in a storm, it's completely by chance. I don't check to see if it's in the trunk of the car. Ladies, you may have a small one that will fit into your purse. But for me, I'll leave the umbrella at home. I, mine will be the first to be found in a lost and found box. You see, I don't think about trying to protect myself from the storm. If I get wet, I get wet. But Jesus is there. He is always with us. And what he wants us to simply do is come to the realization that he himself will give us peace if we just look to him and we can have peace. We can be protected from the storms of life, not of anything in ourselves, but simply because he himself is our peace. In Ephesians 2, 14, Paul wrote that he himself is our peace. Colossians 3, 15, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. 2 Thessalonians 3, 16, now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. No matter what the storm may be, no matter how big, how small, may he himself the Lord of peace be with you. In 2 Peter 1, 2, May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. Let peace be multiplied. Let peace overflow in your life. How? By a knowledge of Jesus. You see, the more you know Jesus, the more the distorted view that this world and that Satan wants to fill you with his lies, the more that is overcome by an encounter with Jesus, the more you will know peace in the midst of the storm. You see, it really is true. It's a quaint little saying, but it is a reality. When there is no God, N-O God, there is no peace. But when you know God, when you K-N-O-W, know God, know God and know Jesus, you will know peace. He himself is our peace. Do you know him today? And so what is the Holy Spirit saying to you? As we ask him to give us ears to hear and eyes to see, will we now allow him to transform our hearts? Some of us today may have lost sight of who Jesus is. You have heard the devil's lies. You've allowed him to play with your emotions. 
There are those difficulties. You are like the disciples who are so caught up in the crisis of the moment, bailing water, trying to do whatever it takes, that you don't see that Jesus is there in the midst of the storm. He's at the point of your greatest need, and He wants to heal your wounds, heal your painful past. Can you see Jesus today? Are you here today and you are in a storm? Oh, it may be a large storm or a big or a small storm. Big or small, doesn't matter. Are you struggling today to see Jesus, to find Him? He's waiting to work from the inside out to heal the wounds, to give you sight to see, to give of Himself, and give you peace. May we receive today what only He can give. Freedom from worry, freedom from self, because He is our peace.